So I'm the guy with the tie, so that must mean I'm the speaker, right? So for tonight, right? So thank you, Jennifer, and to uh, Pachevskit Historical Society and for the Curtis Library for having me and for hosting this. And if I could ask uh, people just to hold any questions or comments you might have until the end, I promise there'll be time for that. Um, I, I know that's hard, but this, uh, this talk is about 40 minutes long, so um, just to prepare you. So if you get bored, you can just kind of look at your watch or your, or your phone, and you'll know how much longer you have to suffer. Okay? So I'm generally not nervous in front of an audience because I do a lot of speaking and I play music too, but I have a little bit of trepidation about some of what I'm going to present tonight because these, you folks are from Brunswick, you know, and your people are attached to their town and to what they know about their town from when they grew up. But the, the Brunswick I'm talking about tonight is not this present day Brunswick. It's not your father's Brunswick. It may not be your grandfather's Brunswick. Uh, we're going pretty far back. And I'm talking about a, a period that's before the memories of any living person. Unless you're 130 years old, then you might remember some of this stuff. But if you're not that old, you won't remember it. And so life was not a bowl of cherries for our ancestors. And, uh, uh, but if, if you stick with me, I'm going to also talk about some of the wise choices that our ancestors made that improved their lot in adverse conditions. So what's my connection to Brunswick? Well, my dad was born here and mostly raised here. Um, we used to come here when we were kids. We'd visit and, and I met relatives here. I was very impressed by St. John's Church when I was growing up. I remember that very vividly with the Latin and French inscriptions that are in that church. I thought that was very impressive. My mamère, papère, vermette are born and raised in Brunswick. That's my grandfather is this little guy over here on the left-hand side. Right? Some of you might remember Lucien Vermette. He was a great fiddle player, lived on Weymouth Street. Uh, his mother in this picture is pregnant with him. He wasn't born yet. This, this photo was taken in 1904. He was child number nine okay, in that, on that list. So what I'm presenting tonight is part of Brunswick's history, but it's also my own family's history. So what I'm going to say tonight comes from documentary sources. So these are some of the sources that I use to put all this together. You've got uh, the US federal and the Canadian census records, manuscript census. You've got old newspapers, many of which from Brunswick have been preserved. You've got the parish records, both from St. John's Parish and also from the parishes up in Canada. You've got the town and state vital records until 1892. Records were kept by the town. After that, by the state of Maine. You've got naturalization petitions. When somebody uh, wants to become a naturalized US citizen, they have to petition the court. There's a lot of information in those records. To a lesser extent, notary records. Those are things like probate and wills and sales of land and things like that. You can learn things from that. And then finally, just the general histories of Franco-Americans and of Maine and of Brunswick and of the period. So that's where all of this comes from. So here's today's agenda. And I don't know how much people know about their heritage, but this is just like the survey course, okay? So what we're going to talk about is, why did French Canadians come to Brunswick in the first place anyway? We're going to talk about where they came from in Canada, how many of them came here, and then how did they live when they first came? And this is going to get us into the story of the Cabot Mill. And what I'm talking about covers only the early period, which is from the end of the Civil War until about 1900. So I'm not going to talk about anything that happened in the 20th century or the 21st century. So why did French Canadians come to Brunswick anyway? Well, it, it was part of a larger movement of French Canadians to New England. We can't understand Brunswick's experience apart from Maine and apart from the New England region as a whole. Between about 1840 and 1930, a million French Canadians about came to New England. Some people say more than that. And they came in several waves. Early in that period, from about 1840 to about 1865, you had a lot of young single men who came. They were migratory. They moved around a lot. A lot of them went back to Canada. After the Civil War, this movement picked up steam. You had entire intact families now coming to New England. 
entire villages in some places were emptying out in Quebec and coming to New England. Well, there's a debate among historians about why this happened. There's always a debate among historians. Right? It's generally two things are generally agreed upon. One, they came from rural areas. Didn't come from big cities for the most part. Tended to come from rural parishes too. They came from the poorest classes of society in their day, for, mostly. It wasn't until communities were established here that some professional people like doctors and lawyers and people like that came. Generally, it was the poorer folks. And we're talking here about rural Quebec. This is overwhelmingly an agricultural society. And the usual theory is that the population outgrew the amount of arable land that people wanted to live in. So in the early years of the French presence in North America, I'm talking way back the 1600s, 1700s, children received an equal inheritance from their parents when their parents died. Both sons and daughters received something. But in practice, the farms weren't divided up. Some of them were divided up, but you can only divide a farm up so much it gets to be too small to support a family. So in the 19th century, generally, the farms weren't divided up. So what you had was an inheriting son. He inherited the farm. He took care of his parents in their old age. And maybe another son could be set up on a farm that was nearby. Maybe another son could be set up on some other marginal farm nearby. If you're one of those younger kids of the 11 or 12 kids, well, you're out of luck. You have to find a job and fend for yourself. And so as the population grew in the fertile land in the St. Lawrence Valley became filled up and people in search of land were driven into remote places. They were far from agricultural markets. They were far from the infrastructures you had in the established areas. In some cases, some historians have said in some of these remote people, in some of these remote places, people were starving to death. There just wasn't enough food. There wasn't enough economics to survive there. So in some uh, and, and the real wealth of some of these frontier places, such as in the eastern townships, wasn't really agriculture. It was timber and minerals and other things. That's where the money went. It didn't go to agriculture. It went to mines and things of that nature. So you had two common scenarios for the French Canadians who came here to the States. One was a farmer who was deep in debt. If you wanted to get your farm going in one of these remote areas, if you wanted to retool your farm in the face of growing competition, you needed to borrow money. There was no system of credit in these places. There was no controls on how much interest people could charge. And so the, the farms got very deep in debt. And so people would come to New England, they'd work in the mills and get cash money to put the family farm back in Quebec on a firm financial footing. And these people generally moved back and forth quite a bit. They'd work for part of the year in New England, they go back to Quebec for part of the year to work the farm. Scenario number two is the sons generally who did not inherit the farm. They became a growing class of people known as journaliers in French, landless day laborers, who worked on other people's farms, or they worked as lumberjacks in forests, or they worked in mines, or in other types of manual labor jobs. All of my Quebecois ancestors who came here to Maine came from this class of people. There was no farm for them to go back to in Quebec. And so these families who were poor and they weren't making it, in many cases would auction off everything that they had to finance the move to the states and the setup costs. Okay, that's a risky desperation play. Right? That's not something you do unless you really have to do it. And so in both of those scenarios, the common denominator, again, is you're poor. On the USA side of the border, there was a big boom of, in industrialism after the Civil War. Industries like textiles, railroads, paper, shoe industries were booming. They required large number of laborers. Quebec industrialized much more slowly. There wasn't enough jobs to support the population growth. The giant sucking sound you hear is all of the workers from Canada coming down here to New England. And in the post-Civil War period, most French Canadian immigrants were economically, not politically motivated. Right? They didn't come here not so, so much because they wanted to. They were very attached to being Canadian. They were very attached to Canada. Right? They were attached to their homeland. They came here because they had to feed their families. And in the case of Brunswick, of course, it was the Cabot Mill that attracted them here. 
and almost the entire French Canadian population of the town before about 1940 worked in the mill at one point or another, or their brother did, or their mother did, or some relative did. So where did they come from? Well, they came from all over Quebec. There were a few families who were Acadians. They came from the maritime provinces. My great-grandfather was actually a Franco-Ontarian. He came from Ontario. But the majority of the French Canadians who came here to Brunswick were from the province of Quebec. However, in most of the towns, New England towns, with large French Canadian populations, there was a critical mass of people who tended to be from one area in Quebec. And in Brunswick, that part of Quebec was then known as the county of Lille and the surrounding counties. So why did people tend to come from one part of Quebec? Because of this phenomena that the sociologists call chain migration. Right? Some people have said that the mills divided Quebec into spheres of influence and they sent people to recruit workers to come down to New England. So then uh, one family would come and word would get back to the brother in Quebec and then the brother would come with his family and then his sister-in-law's family would come and the sister-in-law's cousin would come and the cousin's next door neighbor would come and pretty soon you have a chain of migration from one particular place in Quebec to Brunswick. So where is Lille? Well, you see on this map where, oops, let's go back here. You see where Quebec City is on this map? We're going to blow that up. You see where Quebec City is right here on this map? Lille is in this orangey red square right there. So where you are is it's where the river widens out, down river from the city, river widens out. You're on the south bank of the St. Lawrence. And they also came from these surrounding counties, which are Camarasco, which is right here, Montmagny, to a lesser extent, Temescuata. So a few years ago, I went to this region of Quebec, and I took this picture. This is from the main town in the former county of Lille, which is called lille sur mer right? This is the 1768 church. If you are a Franco-American from Brunswick, you probably have an ancestor who was baptized, married, or buried from this church right here. The parish register of this church mentions people who lived and worked in Brunswick, especially in the late 1860s. Before St. John's Parish was formed, people would go back to their home parish in Quebec to get married or have their children baptized. So you see in that period mentions of Brunswick Franco-Americans in the parish register of this 1768 church. So many times when people emigrate, they go to a place that's geographically similar from where they, from where they came from. So I took this picture and notice the American muscle car back here. <laughs> really, 60s, 70s, Corvettes, that kind of thing, really popular. What I'm trying to show in this picture is that this area is maritime, right? It's right on the water, like Brunswick is maritime. Right? And I took this picture right near the church. In fact, I wish I had taken a picture of this, but right off the edge of that picture over there to the right was a huge commercial vessel. Right? So I think Lille people felt comfortable in Brunswick, geographically. So how many French Canadians came to Brunswick in this period? Again, I'm talking from the end of the Civil War to about 1900. Well, here's an analysis I did from the census. I picked through the manuscript federal census, and I pulled out this data. And as you probably know, the US census has been done every 10 years since 1790. Right? So I did a head count of Franco-Americans in the town to trace the growth of the community over time. So let's actually start even before that table begins. Let's go all the way back to 1840. That's the generally accepted date of the beginning of this movement of French Canadian immigration to the States. In 1840, there are no French Canadians in Brunswick at all, as far as I can tell. Zero. Everyone here, with a few exceptions, is a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant who was born in Maine or in a nearby New England state. There was a small African-American population in Brunswick in the mid-19th century, but it was small. Most people here were New England Yankees. Their ancestors had been here for a while. It was a very homogeneous town, ethnically speaking. Okay, now let's look at 1850. 
1850, there are exactly two families, two French-Canadian families here in Brunswick that I can tell, totaling 11 people out of a town of about 5,000 people. And these families didn't stay. I don't see them in the later census records. They're the front end of a wedge, okay? And this is 1850. That's even before the Cabot Company was formed. So these folks probably worked for one of the predecessors of the Cabot Mill. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, let's look at 1860. So in 1860, you've got a population in Brunswick of about 4,700. There are now 118 French Canadian people here in 13 families. And you notice that these families are related to each other. And I think this is the beginning of that phenomena of chain migration. We see one of these 13 families has children born in Canada, as well as Rhode Island and Massachusetts, as well as Maine. So you see them moving around a lot. We might think of them as migrant workers. Now what happened between 1850 and 1860 is the Cabot Company was formed in 1857. And I think what we see here is the beginning of a process of recruiting workers to come here to work at the mill. So now let's move on to 1870. Out of a total population of almost 4,700, now there are 415 French Canadians. The French Canadian population has quadrupled between 1860 and 1870. And for the first time, we see families who stayed in Brunswick and made permanent homes here. So we can date the beginnings of a genuine permanent Franco-American community here in Brunswick to the 1860s, probably right after the Civil War. And notice now they are 9% of the town. Okay, line up 10 Brunswick people in 1870, there's a 90% chance that one of them is gonna be a French-speaking mill worker. And almost without exception in this period, these folks work for the Cabot Mill. And note that between 1850 and 1870, the overall population of Brunswick went down. It went from almost 5,000 to not quite 4,700. Well, how do we explain that? Well, it's either people died off and there wasn't enough you know, birth rate to replace them. This was also a period of the westward expansion. Eastern states were losing population as people went out west. And I don't think that we can discount the Civil War casualties and also displacement from the Civil War. You got a, a, a pretty small town, you have some people who get killed in the war or displaced, those guys don't come back to Brunswick and have families, you have population loss. So now let's look at 1880. Now the overall population of Brunswick has increased. And if you do some arithmetic with these numbers, you'll find that the most likely case is the population growth in the town is due to the Franco-Americans. Franco-American population tripled between 1870 and 1880. Now there's about 1,200 of them. They're now 22% of the population. Somewhere between one out of five and one out of four people in Brunswick is now a French-speaking person working at the Cabot Mill for the most part. And out of this population of almost 1,200, among those who work outside the home, only 39 of them did not work the Cabot Mill, which means 97% of the population works in the mill. And among this uh, population, we now see in 1880, children as young as eight years old. And you see that in this extract from the 1880 census, okay? A little bit hard to read, but this is my great-grandmother, Albina Willett. It says Albina. Her real name was Albina, okay? She's 12 years old. These are my great great grandparents, Thomas Ouellette and his wife Josephine Racine. They have 12 children between the ages of 20 and 6 months old. Of those 12, that's 12 living children. They had a couple who died, okay? Of those 12 children, 7 of them from age 20 to age 10 works in cotton mill. It says right there, okay? So the, my, this is my 12-year-old great-grandmother. She's got a little brother, 11. A little brother, 10, they're pulling full shifts in the mill between 54 and 60 hours a week. Okay. So let's go back here. Let's look at 1900. Okay, what happened to 1890, some astute person will ask. Well, the 1890 <laughs> census got burned up in a fire, and I think in Washington, D.C. in the 1920s. 
So this is typical Washington. Okay, so we don't have the 1890 census. We have to move on to 1900. The Franco-American population doubled between 1880 and 1900. There's now over 2,500 French Canadian people. And here I'm not counting Topsom, right? We'll talk about the people expanded and moved over to Topsom. Just to keep it consistent, I didn't count Topsom. We count Topsom, you've got over 3,000 in 1900. They are now approaching 40% of the town. Now 38% of the town is the Franco-Americans. And in fact, if we looked at 1910, 1920, we'd find that probably between 40 and 45 percent of the town by the early 20th century was the French Canadians or Franco-Americans. And now we have 39 percent of this community born in Maine, right? So these are folks born in Maine of French Canadian parents. So you've got like a 60-40 split. You've got about 40 percent born in Maine of French Canadian parents, 60 percent born in French Canada and came here to the state. And so what you see in the 1900 census that's really interesting is by this point you have families in Brunswick from China, Jewish people from Russia, you have Syrians, you have Germans. You have a great diversity of people here in Brunswick. It's very, very interesting. So if you look at the manuscript census and you just open it up, you'll see some pages that are 100% Yankee, right? 100% Maine Yankees. You'll see other pages, 100% Francos. Then you see other pages with this mix of people. So in this half century, between 1850 and 1900, there's been massive demographic change in this town. It's really startling. And this mirrors the situation in the East Coast as a whole. Right? So if you look at this, uh, the population density in this last row here, this is average household size. Okay. So I took those numbers and I made a little line graph here. Okay. And what this graph is basically telling you is that at the height of the Franco-American immigration around 1880, you've got on average 18 people living in a household. Okay? And a household was generally what nowadays we'd call a two-bedroom apartment. Okay? So I've seen families in the 1880 census, you've got 36 people living in a two-bedroom apartment. I can't even imagine that. I mean, that's... And so this brings us to the case of the Cabot Mill and how our ancestors lived at this time. Okay. So there were attempts to build a mill on this property at the Brunswick Falls, the Androscoggin River, that went back to the very earliest years of the 19th century. But they were only a modest success. In 1857, Francis Cabot of Boston comes in here with his money, and he buys out the locals and he forms the Cabot Company. And this company is reorganized in 1866 as the Cabot Manufacturing Company, and this with a huge capitalization for the day, and it became a very successful business. Now Wheeler, in his 1878 book on the history of Brunswick, names the principals and the board of this company. And the three principal people in this company were Francis Cabot, this man here, Benjamin Green, and C.W. Freeland. Okay, now Freeland has a lot of experience in the men's retail clothing trade. He's the guy who knows the rag trade. Green had a lot of experience in Connecticut and Massachusetts in the operations and technology of textile mills. He's the operations guy. And Cabot was the money. So in modern parlance, we would say that Freeland was the CEO, Green was the COO, the chief operating officer, Cabot was the CFO, the chief financial officer. Wheeler also mentions the board of this company. The people on the board are all Bostonians. I couldn't find information about one of them, but all the other ones are Bostonians. So the majority of the people behind this company are Bostonians. Cabot's a Bostonian. Freeland was from Worcester, Massachusetts, worked in Boston as well. Green's from Connecticut. All the board members are Bostonians. The only one who lived in Brunswick was Green. He ran the day-to-day -day operations of the mill. So where did the capital come from to come in here and buy this out and, and uh, turn this unsuccessful mill into a very successful business? Well, the Cabots were a very famous Boston Brahmin family. They 
originally made their fortune during the Revolutionary War as privateers. Privateers are people who have papers from the government to, that allow them in times of war to attack enemy cargo ships on the high seas and steal the cargo and resell it. Okay, so they're, they're legalized pirates, basically. I mean, that line between a pirate and a privateer is a piece of paper from the government. Okay, so uh, then after they made a fortune as privateers, then after that they went into the African slave trade business. Francis Cabot's grandfather was Samuel Cabot. His papers are still extant in a library at Harvard. And in there, there's an account for the slave ship Amistad, if you know the story of Amistad. Okay, that's Francis Cabot's grandfather. Okay, then they went into the opium trade with China. This was a big business back then. And I'm not, not making this up, folks. You can read for yourself. Yes, the China trade that's euphemistically called. This is taking opium that was grown in India and Turkey for the most part and trading it in China. But then the slave trade and the opium trade, that got risky in the mid 19th century. So these Boston Brahmin families, the Cabots, the Lowells, the rest of them, put it into manufacturing. Okay, and that, that became the new business. Francis Cabot inherited a fortune. He was born rich. He lived on a house on Heath Street in Brookline, Massachusetts, the still a Tony neighborhood of two to five million dollar homes today. He conducted three businesses from an office in State Street, Boston. He was senior manager in the Cabot Mill here in Brunswick. He was also had a, 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 a manager position in another manufacturing company in Grafton, and he was director of a bank. So the capital for the Cabot Mill here in Brunswick came from Boston. The profits went back there. They recruited a huge labor force from French Canada. They weren't employing a lot of local Mainers. So where's Maine in all this? Maine is the water power. Maine is the natural resource. Maine is the energy. That's what they're using for Maine. So they not only recruited this large labor force from Canada, they also house them, right? So these large blocks right here, I don't know what this whole warren of buildings is over here, but these large blocks are the tenements where 36 people lived in one apartment, for example, right? So conditions in these tenements in the 1870s and 1880s were terrible. There was a major typhoid outbreak in 1881 there was a big diphtheria outbreak in 1886. It affected about 8 to 10% of the group in the town. A lot of the children died from it. Um, and then there was a return engagement of typhoid in 1887. Typhoid is usually caused by drinking water contaminated by sewage. Um, diphtheria is associated with overcrowded conditions. I had a friend of mine who's a, an MD at Harvard Medical School look up the modern literature about diphtheria and doctors nowadays say the single biggest risk factor for getting diphtheria, poverty. It's a poor person's disease. So when this diphtheria outbreak happened in the summer of 1886, Mr. A.G. Tenney, who was editor of the local newspaper, the Brunswick Telegraph, he launched a campaign to get the Cabot Company to help out these employees and clean up this mess in the tenements. He gives a precise way of the way people lived in these tenements at that time. This is a quote from the July 30th, 1886 edition of the Brunswick Telegraph. Quote, the houses are built in close contact. There are no yards. The sheds and privies are nearby. The drainage. The sink spouts are running only a few feet or so outside of the houses where all dirty water is poured out, falling on the surface of the ground, some of which drains into the cellar and leaves one of the most prolific sources of disease. The houses have from two to three stories, some of which are divided into eight tenements. The average number of people is about 12 in each tenement, 96 to a house. The number of rooms in each is from five to seven. Bedrooms are small, many of which have only one window where there are two beds. This will give you an idea of the amount of dirty water and slops that are poured out on the surface close by the block, leaving the most offensive odor that can exist. These large blocks are accommodated with only four privies, giving about 25 people for each privy. And those privies are cleaned only once a year, and this is done during this present hot weather of July. These places have overflowed since the month of May. 
Swine, cows, and hens are kept in sheds, pig pens in close connection with woodsheds, etc., giving additional offensive odor. The wells are in the midst of this filth, some of which are not more than 20 feet distant from the sink spout and privies. Sandy soil as it is in this place, there is no doubt that some of these wells receive the slops in a few days after they're pouring out of doors. The collection of refuse matter in or around the dwelling houses, such as swill, waste of meat, fish, and decaying vegetables, dead carcasses, are all present, giving or generating diseased germs, affecting the purity of the air. They should be considered the worst kind of nuisances. Such nuisances one should be compelled to remove or dispose of, either by burial, burning, or otherwise. Now then, summing up in a few words, the above mention will show the favorable condition for any contagious disease to spring up, unquote. So Tenney says there there were 12 people per apartment. Well, he was way off. Census says there were 18 people per apartment, which means there was about 144 people living in one of these blocks, which means 36 people per privy. You try to keep that clean. I, I, I dare you. All right, so what, what we shouldn't learn from this is that our ancestors were slobs. I talked to an older gentleman, and he said, I used to deliver papers over there in the 30s, and those places were immaculate. And I believe that that's true. I think what we learned from this is that the company tried to house well over 1,000 people, up to a couple thousand people, without investing in an infrastructure to support that many people. I mean, human beings need certain things. If you've got a couple thousand people crammed together in a small space with no yards, there's no garbage collection, there's no place to put the sewage, you got trouble, and you've got disease. And at one point, the town ordered the company to clean this up. Green just ignored it. They made the town deal with it, and the town dealt with it a little bit. So newspaper says that's how people lived. Yeah, and the newspapers say a lot of things. How can we corroborate this from other sources? How do we know that's true? Well, we also have the town vital records. And the town vital records reveal that 35 children died between April and September of 1886. Records in those days, in most cases, do not state the cause of death in a few diphtheria is cited explicitly. That the majority of these children were the victims of this outbreak, we may surmise apart from the newspaper's testimony by looking at child mortality on the years on either side of 1886. So you look at April through September 1885, you look at April through September 1887, in fact, there's a huge spike in that period in 1886. And in fact, it wasn't an equal opportunity disease. All of the 35 children who died during that period had French names. And in fact, I can confirm that these children were dying all around the location where my great-grandmother lived at that time. If we go back here, you'll notice that the census enumerator here on the left, it's hard to read, but he called this dwelling 25. They number each apartment, right, in order of visitation, okay? Two-year-old Marie-Claire Saint-Marie and her eight-year-old brother Alexis Albert died on the same day, April 13th, 1886. Census indicates this family lived in dwelling 23, cause of death, diphtheria. Ten-month-old Joseph Desjardins died on August 26th. This family lived in dwelling 27. Nine-year-old Rosa Leblanc died on June 30th. Her family resided in dwelling 29. The census also tells us that 31 people were living in dwelling 29. We also have the testimony of the parish priest from St. John's, who is quoted in an article written in the 1940s by the linguist and historian William N. Locke. And the, the priest in the 1880s at St. John's with Father Gorman, Father Gorman said, I was burying more babies than I was baptizing. And since we've shown the way the workers lived, I think it's only fair that we now show how Mr. Green lived. This is the Benjamin Green house, right? It was a, it was a frat house for Bowdoin. It was moved, right? This was built in 1874 at a cost of $34,000. That would be about $700,000 to a million dollars today. He brought over craftsmen from Italy to help him decorate the interior with stucco and frescoes and marble. And this is a two and a half story house. Four people are living here in 1880 in this house. Three family members and a live-in Franco-American housekeeper. 
This is Mr. Cabot's house on Heath Street in Brookline. It's not really a great picture, but I, I like that it shows his son sitting on the porch reading the newspaper. So how did the Franco-Americans get out of this situation that they were in? We don't li live like this now, right? We don't live like that now, so what happened? Well, one of the things that happened, the first thing that happened was naturalization. They needed the vote and the political clout in the town and the country in which they were now living. So in 1884, the Franco-Americans met together in a body at town hall, conducting their deliberations in French, and they voted unanimously to become naturalized U.S. citizens. They formed a naturalization society. They elected officers. And one by one, they got one group after another into the court and got them naturalized. And within 30 years of that meeting, not one, but two Franco-Americans had been elected to the Board of Selectmen. Some, as a side note, some people who have written about Brunswick Francos uh, have said that a, a guy named Despo was elected to the Board of Health in this period, and that's another way that the situation was helped out. But unfortunately, that's not true. Despo had a French name, but his ancestor way back when in the 1600s was a Huguenot who came from France to Rhode Island, married into the... English colonists in Rhode Island. His mother was from a really old blue blood Yankee family. Despo was a Protestant. He was a prominent Mason. He's a prominent member of the Republican Party. There was nothing French Canadian about this guy. Okay? So just to clear that up. So in addition to naturalization, we also have a newspaper article from 1885 that says that the French Canadians bought land in the northwest corner of the village that they were cooperatively building dwelling houses there and a larger structure. That's all the newspaper says. It's very interesting, a larger structure. Hmm, what might that be? Well, let's look at this map of Brunswick from 1871. You notice here's the northwest corner of the village. That, what they mean by the village is, you know, the downtown section of Brunswick. Notice that there's very little development over here in this area. I mean, west of Cushing Street, there's basically nothing. There was a slaughterhouse there. I think it was a pork abattoir. And I think this is the area where they bought land and started building dwelling houses. And we can tell what happened when we look at this map from 1901. This is 30 years later. Here's Cushing Street, right? Now, west of Cushing Street, you have a lot of development. You see a lot of development in here. And in fact, my grandfather's family was living right there in 1900. He was six years old. He and his family were living there with another family and a boarder. But anyway, they, were, they got out of the tenements. I think the larger structure that they were building was the first St. John's School, which was here on Oak Street, and the convent that went along with it. I don't know that for a fact. I have to do more research to figure that out. But I think that was the larger structure they were building. So another choice they made is, we need to have a parish school. We got to get at least some of our kids out of the mill and into school. It's another choice. And another thing that happened is some smart investors sensed a business opportunity around this, and they formed the Topsom Land Development Company, and they developed what we would now call affordable housing across the river in the Topsom Heights neighborhood, and the famous pedestrian bridge was built that everybody knows here in Brunswick, right? So that's another thing that happened was expansion into their own homes in Thompson. And so by 1900, you see a real Franco-American neighborhood in the town, which was basically these areas I've blocked off, basically the area between the mill and St. John's Church on Pleasant Street. This area in 1900 is very heavily Franco-American. Also this area over here, Stone Street, Water Street, that area, and then over here in Thompson as well. The, this became, in the early 20th century, kind of the central Franco-American neighborhood. In fact, some of these streets here in 1900 are 100% Franco-American. Oak Street, again, where my grandfather lived in 1900, 150 people live on that street, 100% Francos. Another thing that happened is infrastructure improvements in the town. And this was fought, okay? People don't want to spend money on sewers and things like this. But in fact, in the 1890s and the early 20th century, the general infrastructure for the town was improved. And guess who got to dig the trench and lay the pipe? The Francos did. 
So another thing you see in 1900 is uh, a diversification into other occupations, right? And Cabot Mill is overwhelmingly the largest employer of the Franco-American community, but by this point you see people in other occupations working for the railroad, in trades, a few in businesses of their own, and you see a few st starting to come into white collar jobs like being a bookkeeper for the mill. Okay, so by 1900 we can picture uh, uh, newcomers to Quebec because people are still coming from Quebec all the time. Every week, every month, more people are coming and coming. And those people probably aren't that different than the folks who came in 1870. But now you've got a, an established generation of Franco-Americans in the town, many of whom were born here, and they've become more established. And so, in summary, how did the Francos get out of this situation that they were in was through cooperative institutions, basically like the Naturalization Society, like the building program that they had. They became a community within a community. And this is typically Catholic, right? This is, this is in keeping with Catholic social teaching. Nowadays, if you say cooperative institutions, people think you're a communist, right? But they weren't communists, they were Catholics. See, people work together to lift each other up. It wasn't the culture to say, me, me, what's right for me and mine only, and put myself forward. That wasn't the culture. The culture was, what's best for us? What are we going to do as a community to improve our lot? So, in conclusion, here's some of the themes in Franco-American history in general that we see reflected. In Brunswick, we have a population concentrated on mill or factory work. We have this early period of transience between Canada and the various New England states. French Canadians started coming in for 20 years before there was any kind of a permanent community. We have this slow trickle of immigration, then it becomes a flood. You have the isolation of the population in tenements and enclaves. It's really easy to count the Francos in the 1870s and 1880 census because they're all living together. We're all in like two or three pages on the census. So they were isolated from the the general population in town. In fact, the paper didn't cover any of their events, marriages, what are they, before 1900 at, at least. It was like they weren't there as far as the newspaper is concerned, except for these s sporadic flare-ups where the editor will start pounding the cabot company. You also have the establishment of a permanent community through property ownership and to a lesser extent through national, na naturalization. And then finally, we see the beginnings of a diversification of occupations and participation in the wider currents of American life. So this brings to a conclusion my comments, and thank you very much for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you.